So, good morning. Let us recall what we got yesterday. So, yesterday we got to the fact that if we are considering any quasi projective variety, but in our case, we are working with our favorite modular spaces of curves. Well, Then both the cohomology and the cohomology with compact support, which is in some sense dual in the case of MGN, because in this case it's smooth, but we want in general, they carry mixed Hodge structures. in each degree. And if you remember, this is the good guy, the guy who is, which is smooth uh, and compact. So in this case, the mix of structures are going to be pure of weight equal to the degree. So the reason why is I'm interested in cohomology with compact support is that we can uh, use uh, it to define some additive invariance with values in the Grothendieck group of Hodge structures, in this case, rational Hodge structures. Have a look at the notation of yesterday. Yeah. I'm writing it in the case of MGN because then the situation is less trivial. Anyway, in this case, we get nothing of negative weight, so the filtration starts with W0. And if you remember, I very, uh, the quotient of something by the one before is something that carries a pure Hodge structure. So we can use this to define the class of this in the growth in the group of mixed Hodge structures. And since uh, every mixed Hodge structure is an extension of pure Hodge structures, if we want to work in the growth in the group every time we have an extension, this is equivalent to taking the sum of the two classes in this space. So since everything is so since every mix of structure decomposes an extension of pure host structures, we only need to take pure host structures here. So the generators are the equivalence classes, the isomorphisms classes of pure Hodge structures. To, and we need to define relations, so every time we have 
a long exact sequence respecting the mixed structures, a short exact sequence. Then this gives that the class of B should be equal to the class of A plus the class of C. So in this case, this means that here this will correspond to the sum of the class of W0 that carries a pure Hodge structure of weight 0 plus the class of the quotient of W1 by W0. So the first graded, it has weight 1 and so on. And the important thing is that this, since uh, every time we have an inclusion of a closed sub-variety into the whole variety, we get a long exact sequence in cohomology with compact support. So if we have an X, which is a closed sub-variety of sub y. So the complement will then be an open subset. We have a long exact sequence. <coughs> mapping the cohomology with convex support of u into the cohomology of convex support of the big space, and then the homology with the support of x. And then this being compact support, the degree, I guess, should go up. This means because of the fact that every time we have a short exact sequences, we have additivity. This means that if we take the alternating sum of such classes for different values of k, we get an additive invariant. If we take for any variety x, we take its cohomology with rational coefficients, then we take the class in the Grothendieck group, and we take the alternating sum. I don't care, k okay, may be negative and then everything is zero. So this will give us some kind of Euler characteristic with values in the Grothendieck group. So in particular, Using this long exact sequence, we find in this kind of situation, I mean, even if Y is quasi projective and X is a closed sub variety, so it's not compact in itself, we will find in this kind of situation that this Hodge Euler characteristic, see, if, if you take the one of Y, then it will be equal to the sum of the one of X and U.
and now I see that I'm forgetting all the small c in the notation, but I want to have it. And this kind of Euler characteristics exists in very many forms in the literature because its existence is a straightforward uh, consequence of the fact that we have mixed whole structures. Yeah, I see a question. Do you need X and Y to No, we don't need. You see, this long XR sequence is always there. We can reinterpret uh, uh, this piece as a relative cohomology in M. Yes, as a relative cohomology in this case. So this, this always works. The problem is that if uh, X is not smooth and you want to have something about cohomology, you are not allowed to use Pioncare duality to, to deduce it. So you could write some, something of a similar spirit for cohomology, but then the third term will not be exactly this. So perhaps I will call for today Hodge Euler characteristics. Well, thank you. So how much information do we lose if we pass from the cohomology of something to this Hodge Euler characteristic? Well, if we are able to reconstruct in a unique way from the weight of Hodge structure, the degree from which it comes from, then of course we have not lost anything. So for instance, if we take mg and bar, then we know that the weight will be equal to the degree so if we simply know this Hodge Euler characteristic for mg and bar then from each class we simply look at the weight of the corresponding Hodge structure which is part of the data so from each block we know exactly from which degree it comes so the true information the information is just the same at least if you're just interested in the uh, structures graded vector space with the uh, Hodge structures On the other hand, in general, you can't do this. For instance, for MGN, the new invariant will be weaker. There are mainly two issues. So if we take the, I mean, we can rephrase this dually for cohomology with complex support, but let's say we fix a degree k, then we know that the weights that occur are a priori between k and 2k. So anything which we find with a certain Hodge weight in this description can come, if we find it something of weight w then it will be somewhere between w divided by 2 and w and without some geometrical input there is no way where it comes from and this is actually the harmless part of the problem yeah we find some kind of indication of course about the parity a class from which a class is coming from because we have signs but that's everything that's everything we can say but the worst problem is, of course, that here we are taking differences of classes, so there may be cancellations. Because the fact that we are taking additive invariant is hiding the fact that we are sort of taking some uh, 
long exact sequences of which we have not computed the differentials. So if the differential has some kind of maximal possible rank, then we, are, we have more or less the same thing. But perhaps there is something non-trivial which we simply can't see because it occurs once in odd degree and once in even degree. Anyway, if we want to investigate the relationship between the cohomology of the open part and the, and the cohomology of the compactified modular space, we know that when we, when we try to construct all strata, we need to identify marked points in some way. If you remember, we quotient by the action of the automorphism group of the graph. So somehow we need to refine this environment a little bit to keep track of what the symmetric group is doing. And this is not difficult because if you remember, mixed whole structures are functorial. So this means that if you have an action of the group, this will respect the, mm, the weight filtration. So the idea is that the SN action on MGN and M bar GN respects the mixed host structures on cohomology and on cohomology with compact support. So the idea is that we can take any graded part and subdivide it according to the structure as representations of the symmetric group. So we have any W, any graded piece in the filtration, then we can decompose this. as direct sums of representations, of irreducible representation of the symmetric group. If you remember, they are indexed by Schur polynomials, so we can use them to distinguish spaces. So somehow we can take the whole Euler characteristic, but it's uh, more clever to take uh, the SN equivalent Hodge uh, Euler characteristics in which we are taking values in the growth entity group of Hodge structures with a structure of SN representation. So I wanted to say SN equivalent. Hodge-Euler characteristic is then the characteristics, so the Euler characteristic of the cohomology with contact support on a space with this SN action, so in our case it would be either MGN or MGN bar with values in the SN equivalent group of Hodge structures. Here, here I'm writing SN to remind myself so of rational hold structures.
and how do the structure as representations of a symmetric group. I'm actually describing how this thing works is more complicated than giving examples. So let's think, for instance, about N04. So if you remember, this is just a moduli of four points. On P1, so we can fix the first three should be 0, 1, and infinity. So this is just P1 uh, with three points removed. So this space uh, is uh, irreducible, so H0 is uh, one dimensional, and if you use Poincare duality, this means that H with compact support is also one dimensional, and if you want to, to keep track of Hodge structures, then it will carry, yes. Excuse me? The Euler characteristic with uh, respect to the empty lines uh, in the such structures, is it still an additive invariant? Yes, it is still an additive invariant because somehow it's just the, the same invariant we had before, just uh, restricted to each representation. In the, yes, so if it comes from the fact that if you have a short exact sequence as you had before, then taking the quotient by any uh, subgroup of the symmetric group will preserve uh, the, the short exact sequence. And this is one dimensional, you know that uh, there are not so many representations of the symmetric group of, uh, uh, of rank one, actually just the trivial and the alternating one, and, since this is, and this is clearly a case in which we have the trivial representation, so this is S4 invariant. And well, H1 or H1 with complex support in this case are the same thing. No, they are not uh, the same thing, sorry. What I wanted to say is if we compute H1 with complex support, then we get something which has dimension 2 because one of the three points kills the class of the point in P1, so we get something over than two left. And the idea is that S4 acts according to the only irreducible representation it has of rank two. This is the one. <coughs> determined by the partition two, two. If you prefer, you can write it this way if you prefer to have the Young diagrams. So, what is the going the, to be the S4 equivalent uh, Euler in um, Hodge Euler characteristic of the cohomology uh, well, of M04? Well, we need to take the class of everything. So we need to take the class of Q minus 1, and then add here, well, usually one denotes the class of the representation by the corresponding Schur polynomial and multiplies it. And then the class of the trivial of such is just 1, multiplied by S22. And now I'm making a mistake because this is, of course, H1, so we don't have to add, we should subtract. Yes? This is the, 
So this is my notation for the representation associated to the partition two, two of four. And this is my notation for the Schur polynomial. And actually, there is a standard notation for the fact, uh, for the, for the tight hold structure of weight two. Yes. Sorry. Yes, absolutely. Because I mean, uh, I'm removing. Uh, I mean, they are. Uh, I, Morally, I mean, when I write a good decomposition, I should see the, the, the pure, I should decompose it at least as pure Hodge structures. In some cases, I can also decompose the pure, pure Hodge structures as direct sums of other pure Hodge structures. And the point is that, um, yes, the, the part of the data, of the, the data of the pure Hodge structure, where you, the, the weight is reconstructed is taking the sum of P and Q for any, so, yes, this is uh, intrinsically, yes. So, usually L is used as a notation for the class of the uh, tight structure of weight 2. And since one can endow the growth in this group with a monomial structure in the sense that the idea is that if one takes the tensor product of two Hodge structures, it's the same as this gives a product in the Grothendieck group. Then if we take the class of any other tight Hodge structure, it will become a power of L. So the idea is that we can define the product of the classes of two Hodge structures. as the class of the tensor product. <coughs> yes? <laughs> yes, I mean, it's just one incarnation, because, you know, if you have a motivic class L, then, uh, I mean, in general, uh, motives can be specialized uh, to different theories, and this is the incarnation in Hodge theory. So it is the same L. And it was defined usually as the class of A1. If, and if you look at the commodity with comes support with A1, you find only this. So we know that we can produce Mg and bar by multiplying together uh, Mg prime, N prime, and then dividing with automorphism group of a graph, and this, uh, this means that mg and bar is somehow dominated by the structure of the graphs once you know what happens for mg n. So this is related to the fact, uh, uh, to the structure of modular operas, which was studied by Gessler and Caplanov. in the 90s. Paper appeared much later in 1998. So the idea is that mg and bar is constructed from mg prime and prime, taking a set of values, by gluing them together according to graphs. And this can be rephrased for, formally by saying that mg and bar 
in some sense, is the free modular operad generated by mg prime n prime. Well, I have not defined for you what a modular opera is, but somehow you only need this example. But anyway, okay, that's a topological concept, I think, originally coming somehow from topological applications and from applications studying the deformation theory. And Gessen and Kaplanov use this concept to give a very compact description of the relationship between the Hodge-Euler characteristic of n bar gn and the equivalent Hodge-Euler characteristics of the open modular spaces occurring in the boundary. So the idea is that we would like to study the Hodge-Euler characteristic of m bar g n by keeping track of the structure of S n representations as, as rational Hodge structures. So if we want to encode everything in a generating function, we need some kind of a dummy variable that keeps track of the genus. We don't need to keep the track of the number of points because the SN action already tells us that. But since we are going to glue together products of components, somehow it could be na more natural to work with disconnected curves. So curves which are the union whose connected components are stable curves. So yeah, well, this is just all possible values of G and N. So. So the idea is that we want to obtain this from the same thing, but for the open state. So the first thing is that if we are, want to glue together things, so here we're just starting with the data about all smooth curves. But then we want first to produce all possible normalizations of stable curves. And they are going to be disconnected curves. So we need to produce from this formula the corresponding formula for the generating series for the Hodge Euler characteristics for spaces of disconnected curves. There is actually an operator called exp that transforms this generating series in the corresponding one for curves which are smooth and of the correct arithmetic genus but possibly disconnected. So, 
up to here, we are controlling the normalization, the possible normalizations of elements here. Will we, will we fix the genus? We just have a finite number of possibilities. So, I don't know. I mean, it's just a, it's just a, it, it does not matter so 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 much to me. It's just the the moral the what what the meaning of the construction is. So somehow up to here we need we we can con control the possible normalizations of the curves so they will work in this way. I do think that one can make sense of this, but it's not a. Yeah, but if they are algebraic anyway, the total number of components is going to be finite. Are you saying that and the mark points will still be there? So, Yes. But I, I wrote smooth, so, yeah. I don't, uh, I mean, uh, with mark points, so I don't, uh, it's, uh, yes. Oh, yes, thank you. So the idea is up to here, we are, we are dealing with the possible normalizations of curves, and then, I mean, the, this expresses some generalization of the usual exponential, uh, and uh, it's kind of, kind of operation that is always, often defined when one is working with a uh, regenerated series with some kind of, yes. Yeah, the problem is that I have not uh, uh, defined uh, for you the, I mean, it's the, so if you remember how, how expert is defined in general, you need to take something like uh, a power of a variable and then divide by the, uh, by the factorial, but instead of taking the power of the variable, you need somehow to take the, the class of the symmetric the Kate symmetric product of the of the classes you're taking. So this is what morally is happening. Instead of taking variable and then it takes its Kate power to define the exponential, you need to take the symmetric product. And this uh, and this has something to do with the fact that if you have disconnected curves of the two of the same <coughs> genus, uh, then you get some. Yeah, if there are no further data, you can exchange them. So that's why you have to take the symmetric product for this kind of of operation. But then uh, we need something uh, that keeps track of the fact that we want to be able to identify pairs of points to create the nodes. And the idea is that there is some kind of, op of operator that works for uh, power series with coefficients in the growth and the group multiplied by symmetric functions. So if we apply this, uh, so delta is some kind of Laplacian operator, and then the exponential here uh, says that we, are allowed, that we can apply this, uh, expo uh, this uh, Laplacian operator in central number of times. So, Delta is some kind of Laplacian. So if we apply it once, we are, yes, well, I, I don't think I can explain. I mean, that the, I don't think that the Laplacian operator has a special meaning in itself, but what is interesting is what the exponential of this guy is doing because this operator corresponds to, oper to the operation of forgetting two labels in a symmetric way. So we are identifying, uh, if we had something like uh, n mark points uh, in some disconnected curve, this operator uh, tells us, well, it's encoding all possible choices of two of them in a symmetric way. And then uh, because of this, uh, if you do the operation once you get this, but since this is an infinite sum, you, can, you are allowed to identify in a symmetric way pairs of marked points in any, any number of pairs of marked points. Okay. 
if you want, if you just have one pair of points. The idea is that it has something to do with the fact that inside S, inside the symmetric group Sn, there is a subgroup which is isomorphic to S2 and S minus 2. And so somehow we can take, uh, we can restrict uh, uh, any representation here to this pair and then take uh, the trivial representation here to represent the points. So it's somehow taking the contributions of, for, as a representation of RSN coming from things that are, become trivial when restricted to S2 in some way. So once we do this, what we get out of, so once we identify a point pairwise, we have something whose, uh, um, which has a finite number, a curve which has a finite number of connected components, and all connected components are stable. So somehow if we take it, what we get is the exponential of this thing. So to get exactly what we want for mg and var, we need to take the logarithm which is the power series which is giving the inverse of the exponential of this very, very, very big formula. Actually, there is an explicit formula for, for the logarithm, but in the only implementation I know, it's uh, the formula for the logarithm is so, is so, um, is so slow that actually it's uh, quicker to teach the computer to guess uh, if the exponential is approximating what we want to take. So, yeah. But anyway, that's, uh, that's the idea. So the idea is that if we are allowed to take disconnected curves, then there is this operator that tells us exactly how to transform things. So first we need to transform um, smooth, curve, smooth connected curves to smooth uh, possibly disconnected curves, and then we need to apply the logarithm to uh, go back to what we need. Uh, other questions about this carry formula? You see, it's an infinite series, so if you look at it like this, I mean, it, it gets a little better if I, you know the definitions, but it does not get much better with the definitions. I mean, even to see that uh, if you fix G and N and you want to truncate at that point, you only need the G prime, N prime that occur in the boundary. Even that, yeah, you know, it, you need to look at the formulas a little bit to, keep, to, to check that it's true. But on the other hand, this is part of the proof of the formula because, I mean, the explanation I give you is the, is the reason why this formula holds uh, without taking the dummy variable, but then there is some kind of bookkeeping to, keep, to check that one is keeping track of the genus of everything in the correct way. Yes, yes, and it's called the H. Well, I don't want so something like so. Let me think a little bit. So there is some. There, there must be a reason for this, but I don't. I mean, I, I took the formula for, from the paper because, from my point of view, the, the thing about the power is just some kind of bookkeeping thing, and it's not exactly what I'm most uh, concerned about. So I guess that the only important thing is that the, that the behavior becomes different when you are working in genus zero. So it, it, it has something to do with what, where your unit uh, will lie. And having a unit is very important, for instance, because if you don't have something with a unit, you can't take the logarithm. So there may be some technical reason for this. Otherwise, one could say, yeah, people in mathematical physics are always a little bit strange. Why do they have to call the dummy variable uh, h bar, for instance? Any further questions? So anyway, it looks complicated, but uh, you can think of it as some kind of black box if you take a truncation of this formula according to the, um, to the symmetric group acting here and to the degree of the dummy variable, then you are able to get uh, the 
the cohomology of M bar Gn from the Hodge Euler, the SN equivalent Hodge Euler characteristic of all the strata. So of all the, yes. Is that yeah, exactly. Yes, yes. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So let me write it here because I said it, but I didn't write it. This is the inverse of log. Yeah, but, uh, yes, <laughs> it would be strange otherwise. Yes. So X is more natural, but log is also well defined, at least, uh, well, if you have something starting with a unit. Yes, yes. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Because you get the disconnecting ones just by identifying in any possible way pairs of, uh, of, uh, of edges. The only thing is that one needs to keep track in the correct way of the genus because uh, the identifying edges will change the genus of water. Uh, identifying mark points uh, creating more edges in the graph will change the genus. But anyway, if you have all of them together, you get all of them together. Yeah. So perhaps I will delete this. So what is the meaning of this? From this formula, we have an efficient way of computing the cohomology of MGN, but with all additional structures coming from Hodge structures and as a representation of a symmetric group starting from. Well, a priori, in this formula, one needs all of them, but one, what one needs, what one truly needs is the SN equivalent Hodge Euler characteristics. of the mg prime n prime with g prime at most g and n prime at most n plus 2 g minus g prime. So the things are happening in the boundary. So somehow, somehow, this is the only information that, uh, that you need to feed in here to get uh, the truncation you want of the formula. And using this, Gessler was able to give um, explicit formulas, for instance, for the cohomology of M0 n bar and for the cohomology of M1 n bar, but he had to stop there because these are the cases in which he had a recipe for computing the cohomology of the open strata, starting from genus 2. Well, there was no general, such a general formula for, which would be val valid for all values uh, uh, of g and n. Uh, that, uh, so for, for all values of n, if you take genus 2. So these are the ingredients, but then uh, comes the second question. Well, what is the standard approach to computing the cohomology of the open parts? So if we want to, to have the compactification, that's the only thing we care about. We don't even need the final invariant. We just need this kind of oil, uh, of Euler characteristics. But how do, you, uh, how do we compute this? Well, the point is that uh, there is a standard way 
to compute this using a spectral sequence, because by definition, MGN maps to MG. So, I'm, well, the problem of computing the homology M0, and we'll solve it long before the other ones so that in the 60s, because it follows from work of Arnold about uh, uh, the homology configurations of points uh, on the complex plane. If we take G equal to 1, you may, can, can make this work by mapping to M11, but I'm not doing this at the moment. So this kind of theory also works for uh, G equal to 1, it's just a technicality. So M1 does not exist in our category, but M11 is perfectly fine. And the fiber of the C is just the configuration space of n distinct points on the curve. We will say denoted yesterday, yesterday by F and C. So it sits inside the end product of the curve. So if you wish, this reflects the fact that the MGN lies inside the end fiber product of the universal curve over MG. So this is a hydration, and we can look at the LRS spectral sequence associated to that. And exactly as in the example with curves with rational tails, the E2 term will be determined by the cohomology of Mg. with coefficients in some local system. And then once we have this, this converges to the cohomology of MGN in degree P plus Q. So somehow, the first question is, what is that local system? It's going to be a local system because this is a vibration, so there will be no strange things happening. So in general, local systems on some space will be determined by a Q representation, since we are working with uh, rational coefficients of the, of the fundamental group of our space. one of the base space, which is in this case mg. So this would be all possible representations of the mapping class group. So this is going to become rather, yeah. I mean, the mapping class group is, was a discrete group, but it's not as, as if the representations are not known so well. But actually, in this case, we can see but because of the fact that we are starting as the data with the cohomology of the curve, the only local systems that will occur are those that are related with the representations of the symplectic group. So in this case, this guy is going to be 
an extension. Uh, uh, sorry, this thing is going to be uh, a symplectic uh, uh, local system. Yes, well, if you take it as an odd before, yes. Well, that's because you can realize Mg as the quotient of Teichmüller space by the mapping class group. Teichmüller space is contactive. Yeah, that's it. So, uh, yes, it's, uh, it, it's not easy to see this in algebraic geometry, but if you take an analytic construction, then, uh, then this is fine. So practically, in this case, if we look, look at what the local system is over some curve C, then the fiber will be the acute cohomology of the fiber. And this has a natural structure that is a uh, representation of SP2G. Uh, and this structure is coming from the fact that we already had an action of SP2G on the cohomology of the curve. What happens if you want to know sort of the monodromy representation we need to take in this case? You say, well, I start with a curve, I consider any possible um, loop starting there and ending there, but well, anyway, whatever the, the, the monodromy did, it has to respect this structure, the symplectic representation. So the only thing it can do is to act on it as the symplectic loop. And so in this way, we find the class of local systems that are controlled by the representations of the symplectic group. And we want to take representation of this as, a, as an algebraic group because it's some kind of motivic construction and should uh, be compatible with, with the extension to, to, co to the complex numbers. So what are the reducible representations of SP2G? Well, if we look uh, over the complex numbers, it's clear. In general, by the theory for Lie groups, these are indexed by partitions. Lambda 1 up to lambda g, so the length is equal to the, the size in some sense. And these are the data from which one reconstructs the weight of the action. Anyone has such a partition, one defines the weight of the partition to be the sum of all, of all parts. So for instance, V0 is the trivial representation. 
I'm writing V0 instead of writing V0 G times. I, if I don't write it, I'm only adding zeros at the end. So V1, which is, as I said, my notation for V10 up to 0, is the standard representation. What we will find in the H1 of the curve. So this will play a role when we are considering mg1 fiber over mg. And in general, if we have a v lambda, then we can embed it in a natural way to a sure, a symplectic sure functor into the tensor product of a number of copies of the standard representation equal to the weight. So there is an natural way to cut all the V lambdas inside the space. So if we know the cohomology of all local, uh, of all uh, uh, symplectic local systems of weight up to n, then we can compute the cohomology of mgn. Conversely, if we know the cohomology of mg n, not just for n, but also for all uh, up to n points, then we can reconstruct all local systems of a certain weight. So the idea is that there are explicit formulas for the cohomology of the space of configurations, so that that's not the issue. It's more finding a an effective way to package that information. So the idea is that for each that we need to first to decompose the cohomology of a general fiber into symplectic representations. Once we have this, we can compute the E2 term. using the cohomology with values in the local systems. And then we need to study the differentials. In the spectral sequence. And if instead of computing mg and bar, we simply need to want to know the as an equivalent Euler characteristic of it. We need this only for, we only need the equivalent Euler characteristic of all the fibers, because anyway. And then we can skip the last step because we are working with an additive invariant, so we don't care about differentials. We will get the same outcome. We simply take the alternating sum of the H2 PQ, in a, well, just the sum of the, of the Euler characteristics of the H2 PQ in a natural way. So the idea is that if we just want to know the whole Euler characteristic, knowing it for this space is equivalent to knowing this. Uh, Euler characteristic for the local systems. And if we work here, at most uh, local systems weight up to n will appear because of this fact that uh, we are taking only things that uh, are contained at most in the end product of the standard representation. So you may wonder how this is used. So this is used both ways. 
if one happens to know the cohomology of the local systems, then one computes the cohomology of MGN. But if from, with some geometric construction one can compute the cohomology of MGN independently, still it's more efficient to packet the information into the local systems because they could be used also for other vibrations, so they are more widely uh, applicable. So this kind of uh, sequence uh, of operations sometimes is also applied uh, in the converse order to, uh, st to start with the cohomology of MGN and obtain the cohomology of local systems because this is the way, as I said, in which people, so these are the ones that people would prefer to understand. Then once you have them, you can apply them to understand the cohomology of um, the geometry of n-pointed curves, but uh, not necessarily. So the easiest case in which everything is understood is again the, in the stable range, exactly as the cohomology of Mg is completely understood in the stable range. So long before, so 10 years before the characterization of the stable cohomology of MG was available by work of Martin Weiss. Loyinger already explained how one can deduce from this what happens if one wants to study curves with mark points. And the idea is that the cohomology of MGN stabilizes in the same range as the cohomology of Mg. And the limit object should be generated, of course, by the kappa classes because we have the forgetful map to Mg. But we will need additional generators which are simply the couple classes. So this also means that uh, in this kind of situation, the tautological ring is exactly the extension of the, of the, uh, stable, of the stable cohomology. So it was, it's what is generated by the stable um, cohomology outside the stable range. Yes, and once this is known, there is a, actually the, he also proved the corresponding theorem for V lambdas, where it's intended that if you increase the genus, then you simply increase the lambda by adding uh, t zeros trivially, as I was doing before, stabilizes. But you need to reduce the range according to the to the uh, weight of the, of the local system. So if we had uh, 3 half k plus 1, now we have 3 half of k plus lambda. Plus 1. So g should be larger. And then there are explicit combinatorial formulas. So if you wish, also the cohomology of Mg with coefficients in the local system has some kind of tautological cohomology. That's what we obtain by taking this uh, combinatorial part uh, and taking the natural extension of this. There are papers about this, or preprints, because by um, Pedersen and, and Tavakol, for instance. And then there is a single good case in which uh, the uh, cohomology of every single local system has been known for a long time. This is a case of genus one. As I said, the same construction carries on.
And the source of this information is Eichler's Shimura theory. So the idea is that there is an explicit description of the cohomology in this case in which the basic part was done by the linear, but then an important detail appeared later in a paper by Elkick. So the idea is that in these cases it's slightly easier to work with cohomology with compact support so that the formulas for the weights are more uniform. So if the, here the, the genus is equal to one, so we get just one integer, and it's easier to prove that if the weight is odd, then the cohomology is trivial. If the cohomology, if we are taking V0, we know what happens. So here we are taking K at least one. And then the cohomology of the local system V2K, which is just the k symmetric product of V1, has two parts, a Hodge structure, so a pure Hodge structure of weight 2K plus 1, which is usually denoted by S 2K plus 2, and then a one-dimensional part of weight 0. And uh, this follows from the from work of the linear should have some kind of motivic interpretation. The fact that the sum is a direct sum is what what uh, L kick proved. And there is also a natural way to find a, so this is a two-dimensional. And there is also a natural way to find a generator here. So this is a pure hot structure of odd weight. And in this case, uh, the two pieces uh, of the Hodge composition are uh, in the extreme position. And the first one can be actually identified with the space of cusp ones for SP2, but this is the same as L SL2. Z. of way 2k plus 2. So you may wonder what a, what a, um, what a cusp form is doing here. And if I have some Sometimes I do have an uh, explanation for this. Yeah, but I already know that I will not have so much time. So perhaps I should permute things and try to explain to you now. So the idea is that if we want to, to have a cusp form here and something which is non-trivial,
the first non-trivial case of the CASP form is the CASP form of weight 12. So what is a CASP form? This is a holomorphic function. on the upper half plane. This behaves well uh, when we apply, when we take its value and apply it, uh, and we consider the action of the uh, of SL2Z. So if we take gamma in SL2Z, then it will act on tau in the usual way by taking a tau plus plus b divided by c tau plus d. And then one has that f of gamma tau should be equal to c. So the denominator here is to which has certain power, and this is going to be the weight of the module of the cusp form. And to be a modular form in this case, it needs to ex extend holomorphically to the only to, to infinity, so to the to the boundary of H one and vanish there. So once we have such a thing, what can we do with it? So the idea is that here, the first non-trivial example is, the, is a cusp form of weight 12, the discriminant form. So it's a function of a variable z, but actually it factors to the, it's periodic, so one writes it this way, as a function of q given by the exponential of z. And then the classical way to identify it is to write it as a as an infinite product by taking one minus q to the power n to the power 24. Oh. So I'm not an other theorist, so I'm not going to explain to you why this kind of thing is well defined. But the point is that it transforms nicely when we apply the SL2Z. But for genus 1, this is exactly the group. So uh, if in genus 1, if you take the quotient of H1 by this group, we obtain exactly M11. Because this is the modular space of elliptic curves. Yes. Oh, yes, it does not make sense. If uh, my students uh, would write, write that, then they, they would not pass the exam. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So the idea is that once we have a cusp form, there are ways to um, use it to construct a differential form of M111. 
how. Well, in this case, for instance, so of M1n, but, this case, but in this case we have weight 12, so we can work on M1 11. Now we want to use uh, the upper half plane, uh, so Ziegel space, to, to dis describe M111. We can say, well, if we are working with M11, the first point is known, so we need to take uh, the universal curve over it and 10 copies of it to keep track of the other 10 points. So what are we are doing? To keep track of the curve, then we need to have S1, H1, and divide it by the group. And this will give the isomorphism class of the curve. This is the standard thing for ellipticals. And then the idea is that, so, E will be then just given by the quotient of C by the quotient by the lattice, Z plus Z times two. And this is, of course, a rank two lattice. So the idea is that if to, ten give, if to give 10 points, we need to fix 10 points on this plane, and then we will have an action of the 10th product of some Z2, where this semi-direct product comes because, of course, we also need in the process to identify Z2 with this lattice. So the idea is that uh, what we need to define is a differential from here that descends to the quotient. And because of the symmetric uh, property, we can use the delta as a coefficient. Excuse me. Ah, you're saying that I'm taking it the other way around. Oh, let me think about this. No, I, I do think that the, when I write like this, the normal subgroup should be, should be the one to the left. Because this is the intrinsic one, and this is the one that needs uh, data from here for the identification. So, if z is the variable here, and we denote by theta 1 up to theta 10, the ones here, we simply take everything. And one can check that this is invariant with respect to the group action. So we get a differential form on M111, and in particular we get a class in some cohomology of the sheaf of, dif of holomorphic differential forms over X. And by the way, in which uh, pure host structures are defined, this is exactly the 11, 0 part of the cohomology. Oh, sorry. This is not x. This is m1, 11, because that's the space in which we are doing things. And by doing the bookkeeping, I was saying before, this is actually exactly the contribution of the local system uh, V10 in this case. So this is giving us the, let's say, the holomorphic part, and then H011 is simply the complex conjugate of this, which is generated by the complex conjugate of this form.
and this is not some kind of lucky coincidence. The idea is that this is the way in which it works for genus 1, for genus 2 and genus 3, this kind of construction where you need to replace H1 with Ziegel space, SL2 with the symplectic group, and then what you get is the modular space of principally polarized abelian varieties, but uh, using the Torelli map, one gets a map from NG into the modular space of principally polarized abelian varieties. H1 extends to a larger space in which the elements are symmetric matrices of size G rather than just complex numbers. And then we are divided by the symplectic group. And for G equal to 2 and 3, this map is dominant. Indeed, for G equal to 2, we get an isomorphism because this map extends to, cur extends to curves of compact type. And also the automorphism groups of the corresponding Jacobians are the same, so this is the identification, and so we can do exactly the same kind of considerations, and we can use it to uh, take modular forms in lucky cases and construct uh, uh, this kind of interesting hold structures, which are the most non-tautological of all in this case. For G equal to 3, this map is still dominant, so we can control things in this way. But this is generically 2 to 1, because here all abelian varieties have an automorphism. So the automorphism group of the Jacobian of the curve is the extension of the automorphism group of the curve by um, an involution. So the idea is that for genus 1, there was a nice formula. In this way, Gesser gave an equally nice formula for the cohomology of n bar 1n in the form of Hodge-Euler characteristics. In this, uh, in this uh, um, if you increase the genus and go to genus 2, you need to, uh, there was a, it was more difficult to know how to replace the description of the local systems. And in this case, most of the information is actually coming from point uh, from taking, from counting the number of points m to n divided over finite fields, and in this way producing at least an estimate of what the hodge euler characteristics are there. And this gave some kind of conjectural description of the relations to spaces of uh, Ziegel modular forms, which are the, the, the Ziegel cusp forms, which are the extensions of what we discussed now, and this has sort of been proved now by Peterson. So I guess in this case one could uh, now work with the hodge euler characteristics more in general. For genus 3, the description is completely, uh, is completely open yet. It's the Hodge-Euler characteristic is only known up to seven points, I think. And here, part of the issue is that if you take many map points, you may, because of the fact that some information gets lost in this map, you may get contribution of uh, some things that can be interpreted as modular forms, but are directly related with the, uh, with the with the Teichmüller space, so they are called Teichmüller modular forms rather than Ziegel forms. And it's uh, something I think uh, Bergstrom, uh, Fab, and Van der Heer are working on. So I, I hope I <laughs> could give you, I mean, I wanted to give some kind of introduction to the fact that there are, there somehow, uh, there are natural ways in which also things coming from number theory sit inside the modular space, and the fact that uh, one gets highly non-trivial and non-tautological things in this way. And I hope in this way I have made your picture more complete. So my aim is uh, uh, reached. Thank you for your patience.